Chant 1966. It's 1966. That's 54 years ago. Mighty trip to the Dubont and Thelon Rivers in Canada. This is going to be a four part video. Part one, you're at, is our goals and route. And I'm hoping you do these in order. This is not going to be one of these 15 minute YouTube videos. It's going to be intensive as we go uh, on an adventure on a scientific collecting um, expedition in 1966. So here are the four parts. I'm hoping you're going to do these in order. In order. And this is part one. It's dedicated to all those who pursue science as a way of increasing our collective knowledge about the world and our place in it. And also to these three individuals, Dr. Donald Chant, Dr. James Chilcott, and Dr. Roger Hansel, who kept me alive during that summer of 1966, though not necessarily safe on a canoe trip, a collecting canoe trip, through the Northwest Territories of Canada at that time. My intended audiences are wilderness canoers, Eskimo carving collectors, and that will be in uh, part four, Dubant Thelon River fans, Moffat 1955 trip historians, and we'll talk a bit, a bit about that, field ecologists and mite experts, and my kids and grandkids. So this is part one. I'm going to talk about my journal and my slides, the newspaper coverage of our trip, project history, and the four people who went with uh, on this trip, the route that we took, and then uh, Tyrrell, 1893, Moffat, 1955, wa went on this same uh, route. Uh, though we didn't go on the entire route, we went on part of that. And then the, the Dubont River, most beautiful on earth. One, one person said that. Is that true? Uh, the Thumb 1966 canoe trip. And then the Jacobs Moffat defense. So that's what I have planned for part one. So let me give you an introduction. So I'm sitting here in my office trying to figure out uh, an inspiration for my next YouTube video. And I look on my shelf and I see, oh, look, I still have my journal that I uh, wrote in in 1966. And the journal is Chant 1966 Expedition, Log of the Journey and Field Notes. And it was done with rapid rapidograph pen, as you can see there. And the pages are coming out, and so what I did was I numbered the pages uh, in July 9th. So since July 9th, and, and this is the end of August, I've been working on this video. So what can I put in the video besides the journal? Well, I was a photographer on this trip, and I had hundreds of slides, hundreds of wonderful slides. But various moves and uh, a downsizing and then uh, retiring and clearing out my office. And I find out that I only have 26 slides of this expedition. Well, I can do quite a bit with 26 slides and all the other resources I brought to bear uh, on these this four part video. So I hope you will enjoy it and get a lot out of it. So what were our goals? Why were we there? Well, we can look at some newspaper headlines. Sudden danger in Bass Beautiful Region. Four scientists seek tiny mites in far north. Scientists overcome danger. 400 mile search for mites. Scientists Canadian bug hunt becomes real outdoor adventure. Well, sounds exciting, right? And here are some of the headlines. The main one, uh, the main article was in the Riverside Press Enterprise. 
in December 4th, 1966. And I want to thank Ruth McCormick, the librarian, who went the extra mile to find the article. Uh, I had this article, at least the text part, in my scrapbook, but I didn't have the date. I knew it had come from the Press Enterprise, and the microfilms are at the Riverside City Library. She really worked hard to find the article. And the many others, many, many others, who responded, responded to my futile attempt to try to see if the TV show, because this is actually um, uh, advertising a television show on our trip, or copies of my slides still existed, and they don't apparently still exist. So the article starts by saying, on January 7th, 1967, television viewers will take an exciting canoe trip down the Dubont River of Canada's Northwest Territories, seeing dangers faced by four scientists who made the 400-mile journey last summer. Their quarry were tiny, insect-like, predaceous mites for the University of California at Riverside's intensive search into biological control of citrus pests, including other mites, which may be the prey of the northern cousins. And remember, this is the time when Rachel Carson had, had uh, produced the Silent Spring against insecticides. And there was much uh, interest and, and, and a lot of uh, money being put into other ways of controlling agricultural pests. And so this was a cutting edge uh, uh, subject. So I, for this, uh, this video sequence, I subscribe to a, a uh, newspaper archive um, online service and found all sorts of neat articles. In fact, I found this article that uh, gave me an, a uh, background in terms of what this grant was that I was on. And that was really new stuff. So this was published in uh, 1965. And it tells me a little bit about the project that I was on. And Don Chant was awarded a two-year grant from the National Science Foundation. It was, it was uh, uh, given to the University of California at Riverside, uh, hereafter I will call it UCR. And that, that grant, in terms of $2021, $20, is about over you know $220,000. That was a good grant. And in the summer of 1960, he and his graduate student, Roger Hansel, you meet Roger, made a six-week collecting trip up the Alaskan Highway to Fairbanks, Alaska, collecting mites. The grant's second year would have the two with two UCR arthropod faculty taxonomists, those are people who name species, for 90 days hiking and canoeing over 800 miles of primitive country in northern Canada. And uh, the article goes on to say this was a vast area that was unexplored by mite experts. They didn't know what was there from Hudson Bay all the way to the Pacific. That's why he went first up through Alaska. And Don says that our route in 1966 will be along the Dubont River system from Holdia Lake, Northwest Territories, to Chesterfield Inlet on Hudson Bay, a distance of about 800 miles. This area can be crossed only by canoe, and a four-man, two-canoe expedition is minimal for safety and convenience. Of course, you could, you could probably hop around with a, uh, a float plane. It could be much more expensive. And so we learn, and I learn, actually, between 1960 and 1963, Don Chan collected mites in an area from Toronto to Vancouver, and in a subarctic area of Quebec province that was beyond the tree line, traveling by canoe. So there's where his canoe experience came from. But sometime after the, uh, the Alaskan trip and after that article, the planned 1966 route was shortened 
and two of the scientists committed to the, to the trip changed their mind. And a fly taxonomist, James or Jim Chilcott, that'll be uh, the third person on this trip, from the Canada Department of Agriculture was substituted. So where do I fit in? A fourth replacement member withdrew late in spring 1966, about a month and a half before they were supposed to leave, leaving Chant with a major problem, a major, major problem. At that time, there were three Canadians on a National Science Foundation grant to UCR, and uh, I'm guessing that was probably needed was another UCR researcher, probably non-Canadian, who was willing to spend a summer on the expedition. And that's where I come in. So why me? I use my this uh, phrase a lot in my classes. Chance favors the prepared mind. That's Louis Pasteur, but Joel Weintraub adds to that. And sometimes the unprepared as well. So if you look at my log, and I'm going to show you a lot of pictures of the log. Um, this is a record kept of the Dubon collecting trip in 1966. I'm writing this before the trip. This is May 25th in 1966. And my place on the trip came about by a lucky withdrawal of Bland Ewing. He was a graduate student in the entomology area. Pete R., that was probably Pete Rausch, was asked to go, but he had planned a trip to British Columbia. So I was there, third choice, maybe even the fourth or fifth choice. After I gave a seminar for a chant, and I was in, in biology, uh, but I had interests uh, across the board. And the title of the Biological Control Graduate Seminar interested me. So I joined all those entomology students there. And after I gave a seminar for him, I was asked to see him. At that time, two weeks ago, I asked, when he offered me this, this opportunity, uh, I, I asked to think it over, although I had already made up my mind. The decision to go may add a half a year to my graduate time, but one gets an opportunity like this, an offer like this, only once. And with no regrets at that time, I officially accepted the offer on Monday. So that's how I ended up on this group. I didn't know anything about canoeing, about paddling. In fact, I am a very poor swimmer. Um, I can only pat, uh, dog paddle, basically. I don't think that's an Olympic sport. So the journal says on May 26 that Roger and I, after a late start, decided we would go canoeing. Uh, and the nearest lake, I guess, that had canoes to Riverside, California, was Jenks Lake. Not a very large lake. And even though canoeing is supposed to take no effort, uh, et cetera, I worked at it. Even This is after I accepted this. Obviously, haven't learned yet to row easily. Whoops, whoops. Got to gotta learn how to, how to do these canoe lingo. Uh, I guess it's paddle to show you how raw I was in terms of this. In fact, preparing for this talk, I ran across this article by Bill Lehman, Paddling the Dubon River, April 13th, 2002. Now you tell me, Bill, why don't you tell me then? So when you read this, Bill says, be sure to remember that the Dubon River is a very remote river. You can expect no help if you get in trouble. And you best be a darn good paddler, well-versed in subarctic barren's travel. In short, the Dubon River shouldn't be the first north of Tree Line River you decide to paddle. Uh, hey, Bill, that's not only my first north of Tree Line River, that's my first river period that uh, I went on a canoe trip. Is it too late to change my mind? In addition to that, I didn't ask Don, what are your qualifications that I'm putting my life in your hands? It's only when I started doing this video that I found all sorts of things, such as that Don had gone on a 
trip with three entomologists, people who study insects, uh, in 1963 and published a little article in the Beaver, which is the Hudson Bay Company uh, magazine. And he indicated that they were of average ability as canoeists and wilderness travelers. That doesn't look good. And then I saw this paragraph. Towards the end of our trip, this is Don speaking as a, as a major author. Towards the end of our trip, the river had become of tremendous size and sweep. On our last day, we were impatient to reach Rupert's house and foolishly ran all but one of the stretches of fast water we encountered. Uh, just a second. Uh, you get impatient, you do things hurriedly, you make mistakes, which fortunately presented no real hazard. Whew, no real hazards. Uh-oh, though we badly crack one canoe in a submerged rock in one stretch that looked rather like an enormous escalator from its brink. You don't call that a real hazard? The final rapid where the river enters its estuary and Rupert Bay can only be passed by half swimming and wading our canoes. Great for someone who dog paddles. One of us lost his footing and was washed head first about 50 feet down a torrent completely submerged and bumping painfully against every rock. However, our luck held. I'm not interested in luck. And no serious damage was done other than to his dignity. Um, you know, I'm getting even more uh, thinking maybe I'll turn down this offer. But I guess I'm stuck with it. So here is the science team. Dr. Donald Chant, Canadian Chair of UCR's Department of Biological Control. And actually, uh, on um, uh, the video four, I'll talk about where we uh, went after this trip. He became one of the leading environmentalists in Canada, a very well-known individual. Dr. James Chilcott, Canadian Government Taxonomist, lots of above tree line experiences. Uh, that's uh, who shared the canoe with me. Don't really know what his uh, canoe background was. And uh, Jim died on his next field trip in 1967, collecting insects in the Himalayas. We'll talk about that in, in the, fourth, uh, the fourth video. Roger Hansel, Canadian graduate student at UCR under Chant. Uh, we talked about him. Uh, he went on to a distinguished career and as a president of a university right now. And then here I am, a New Yorker. Got to watch out for these New Yorkers. Graduate student at UCR's biology department, vertebrate ecologist, not an entomologist. No subarctic experience, no canoe experience. And here we are. And remember, I'm taking these photos, so I'm in not, not, not many of them. We're at Stony Rapids, Canada in June of 1966, waiting to be flown uh, into uh, our, our starting lake. Don is on the left. Take a look at him. He lost 21 pounds uh, during, the, uh, during the trip. Roger Hansel lost over 10 pounds. And there's Jim Chilcutt. And here's me at the end of the trip at Aberdeen Lake, Canada, in August of 1966. You see, they, they don't call that the barren grounds behind me for nothing. So I had to uh, uh, rethink what I was going to do. My rule of thumb has been never study anything smaller than your thumb. As a vertebrate ecologist, I didn't have to do that. But now, uh, I had a month and a half to get all my gear together and to come up with my own projects. So my journal uh, is filled with ideas. Uh, Dr. Newell, one of the original grant people, gave me a project to collect water mites. And there are instructions I wrote down on uh, in my journal, and that was done. So I, effect I successfully did that. A number of other possibilities were down there. I crossed those out, didn't consider those. My background at that time was in reptiles and uh, uh, amphibians, although I have a background in birds as well. Uh, and I did general distributions, collections of 
uh, amphibians, uh, ecological data. Uh, the X's uh, turned out uh, not to be possible. In terms of mammals, I did uh, a lot of trapping, over a thousand trap nights. We'll talk about that in video four. A very low, very low populations uh, of, uh, along the route. Very disappointing. And then in birds, I had a bunch of projects, uh, but basically low diversity, and the only thing I could do is general distribution. So those were the projects uh, that I decided for myself, uh, along with photo photographing uh, the, uh, the trip. So I'm going to show you the route through the Northwest and Nunavut territories. Uh, Nunavut territory uh, officially separated from the Northwest Territories on April 1st, 1999. So when we went to this area, there was only the Northwest Territories. So keep that in mind. And uh, at the end, uh, Don, Don figured out that we paddled about 370 plus miles. That would be equivalent to go from Disneyland in Anaheim at the bottom all the way up to Sacramento, to give you an idea. Uh, it took us two months to do that. It actually took us seven weeks. So I'm going to take advantage of Google Earth uh, and show you the, the trip uh, this way. And then uh, on some of the other videos, I'm going to show you conventional maps. And Google Earth is, is an interesting uh, program. Uh, there's Hudson Bay to the right of my, uh, my uh, hand, right there. And uh, I go to the left, which you can't see, and I ask for a tour. Now, uh, tours, you go up and down, up and down, but instead I'm going to actually move, move the earth. Uh, our first stop was Holdia Lake. It's a long lake. We were at the outlet of it. There's an emergency campsite already. Crazy. Then 7-6. Now, we're following the Dubon River. It may not be clear that there's a river there. There's Hindi Lake, a wonderful area. And you can just barely see where the, where the, uh, uh, the river might be. This is Boyd Lake. And the, I recorded the latitude, longitude of our campgrounds, so uh, campsites. So you're uh, looking at uh, nights here. So between 7.15 and 7.16, we, we went that far. Cary Lake is an interesting lake. We'll talk about that. And there's an emergency camp there as well. What were we doing? Then here's Markham Lake. And you're starting to see the... Do oh, there's the Mosquito Lake over there. Um, they, all, they all could be called Mosquito Lake. Nicholson Lake. And then we're going to move to the northeast... Uh, first, we're going to cross the line between the Northwest Territories to the left of that line. The left of the line to the right of the line is the Nunavut Territory. And here we are, Dubont Lake. You've all heard of Dubont Lake, right? I, I read that it's the 16th largest lake, freshwater lake, and that may be redundant, in North America. You can see how fall we can go uh, canoeing in a day and then we're going to cross the lake and we, we did a, uh, a, a chance uh, risked something to cross that lake went to, into the outlet bay and then you can see that Dubont River is being um, uh, much more defined we had to go on a two mile portage into Grant Lake and then uh, Grant Lake, we moved up from there. Current's getting stronger can, and make, make uh, quite a bit of mileage. And then we went into Wharton Lake. A little tricky to get out of this lake. Uh, and an early explorer spent three days trying to figure out how the Dubon River left it. It uh, leaves it right about here. And then we're going to go in the inlet of Marjorie Lake. There's two ways of getting in there. There's a west channel and an east channel. We're going to be spending some time there because a person, a previous expedition died on the inlet. 
There's Marjorie Lake, Lady Marjorie. And then uh, the Dublin River, river uh, goes to the northwest, strange, uh, before it then joins and then goes uh, on a major river going out to Hudson Bay. You can see this thing goes all the way to the northwest. Uh, there is the delta of the Dubon River. Uh, it goes into what's called Beverly Lake. And Beverly Lake then joins uh, at that point with the Thelon River. And uh, we go into Aberdeen Lake and we're picked up uh, by float plane. Boy, that was tiring just to go through that. And we did that in five weeks. No, not five weeks, seven weeks in 1966. So I want to give you some history of the route. I would argue, I would argue that there were three canoe expeditions on the Dubond that were there to increase our collective knowledge. Tyrrell in 1893, Moffat in 1955, and our 1966 collecting trip. So Tyrrell, and sometimes it's spelled with one R and sometimes with two R, in 1893 was a geologist surveyor uh, for Canada. There's an excellent website at the University of Toronto. Uh, it includes his notebooks, uh, uh, his uh, reports. He took photographs in 1893. And he and his brother, he and his brother, so he was J.B. and his brother is J.W., uh, surveyed this area with six Indians. He lived to be 99. He died in 1957. And those uh, notebooks and all the publications are really important and are used for, by people who canoe through this area. And our party had Terrell's route information uh, to help navigate the river system. For instance, here's July 6th journal. July 6th, 1966. We waited most of the day for our clothes to dry and the food. Oh, that's interesting. What happened in July 6th? Well, we'll find out later. Finally, at about 4.40 p.m., we started canoeing, misspelled, after breaking up camp. We didn't run any rapids completely, but lined or walked the canoe down the rocky shores. Tyrrell's description of the route remains pretty accurate, and some of the rapids he comments on were not seen on the aerial photographs we had. At 10.15 p.m., which was still light, um, you know, and, and some, some early nights you could probably read signs throughout the entire night at distance, we established camp after going about seven miles. The maximum we, we actually canoed was 24, and we could have done better uh, toward the end. We lined down about four rapids. Many bends in this river contain shallow, swift water. Now, there's a very famous spot along the Dubont River uh, named for uh, Tyrrell, Tyrrell's Kern. And uh, I'll tell you about that. This is July 19th. Uh, it says, uh, we put in a strenuous 18-mile day. The lake, and this would have been Cary Lake, was mirror still when we left at 10 a.m. Visited Kern Point on Cary, where Tyrrell, or Tyrrell, I'm going to pronounce it Tyrrell, was supposed to have left a Kern. On top of Summit, found two notes. One from a geological survey of 1955, and keep that in mind, I'm going to talk about that note later, and the other from the Thumb Party, which passed through July 7th. So there was another party that uh, was passing through before us. We knew about that before the note. I'm not quite sure how we knew that. Um, at one time, we thought that we were the first people after Moffat to do this area. It turns out we're not. But we're probably about the fourth or fifth uh, canoe uh, group that went through. The wind picked up after this, and the waves, wind, and flat land took its mental and physical toll on us. 
when one is paddling, see, I got that right, without any landmarks, each stroke does not seem to lessen the distance between canoe and goal. Stopped off in the middle of the lake on small island, which seemed to be created by ice, sheathing, pushing rocks up over self. Small tundra in middle of this area. Trees, spruce, disappearing at a fast rate, and firewood is becoming more of a problem. Firewood's a problem on the, on the uh, barren grounds because you want some hot meals. You want to cook things. And so either you bring all your own fuel with you, and you're going to have to do something there, uh, or you're dependent upon firewood when it's available. And so in the planning of these canoe trips, um, uh, fuel is always, uh, always a problem. Left note, left note at the Kern. Couldn't find any paper. So Don, who is a chain smoker, used back of Lucky Strike Pack. Use the back of a Lucky Strike Pack. I'll give you some more background. We paddled into a gusty wind most of afternoon, though wind died down last two hours paddling. Now camped at river at junction of two rapids. We thought we might have to portage here, but the rapids looked like it can be walked. The next day we should be doing a lot of walking. Country is full of rocks with rare sites of actual bedrock. Saw one caribou the evening and had fine meal of caribou roast from the previous animal. During the, the trip, we shot two caribou to supplement our diet. Uh, I mean, we fish, fish, fish is not a good diet. Meat seems to be holding up. Had caribou stew for lunch instead of our daily ug stable of soup. Black flies here, so bad that Jim wore a headnet. Rare thing for him. So that 1955 survey party's note we found uh, at the Kern may have been the same one that the Moffat party, which we'll discuss next, saw in 1955. And who indicated in uh, Skip Pessel's journal, stopped at the side of Turrell's can for lunch, but were disappointed to find only a note from a survey party this spring. They cheat with airplanes. Now, you know, you can take that as a humorous statement or even sarcastic. I believe he meant that seriously. And you'll see why when we look at the Moffat party that uh, Skip was part of. And the uh, Riverside Press Enterprise article uh, indicates they, in they interviewed uh, Don uh, that he said Tyrrell's uh, Kern and top a glacier deposited rock. That's why that big rock is there. At Cary Lake was rebuilt, rebuilt by the Chan Chilcott group. It will serve again as a beacon for the next party. My journal doesn't indicate that we spend time in reconstructing that. Brian Johnson um, self-published a book on top of a boulder where he had a whole bunch of these notes and he published them. And so I, uh, I contacted Brian. We had a very nice correspondence. And uh, it turns out that the first note uh, that, is, that he found uh, was from the Thumb Party. And our Lucky Strike package is not there. That's really too bad. That would have been, uh, I think, one of the highlight notes uh, of that. But our note is not there uh, on there. And these pictures are from uh, Terrell. Um, and uh, there are probably, I don't know if that's his brother from the right, but remember, there are six Indians there, and there are some really cute uh, photographs that I can use uh, in, in this talk. The next group I want to talk about is Moffat in 1955. Uh, Art uh, Moffat was the organizer. Uh, he was uh, the one in charge. Fred Skip Pessel was second in charge. And those two, um, well, we'll talk about those two. And then there were four other individuals. I think none of them were over 22 years of age except for Art. 
On 14th September 1955, Art died, died of exposure to cold water immersion and freezing air temperatures on the Dubond River's inlet to Marjorie Lake. Others in the party of six canoeists could have also died that day. Major tragedy. The trip has been baked into the lore of wilderness canoeing. Why the expedition found themselves in their predicament has been debated ever since. And I will say that what happened to Art and his party 11 years before we went on that route, and we thought at one time that we were the next organized canoe party that did so, weighed on our minds during the planning and execution of our 1966 trip. And we made sure to get to our pickup point on August 31st with days to spare. And I want to weave the uh, the Moffat expedition uh, into uh, my narrative of our own expedition. So to prepare to make this four-part video, I re-looked at that tragedy. The last thing I read on it was in 1966 with the 1959 Sports Illustrated two-part article uh, based upon uh, journals that uh, his widow had uh, shown Sports Illustrated. And my own journal has notes on a conversation with a bush pilot and his interactions with Art. So I have some other information about this. So not, not knowing much about it except what I knew in 1966, which was the stories you, you won't believe that went around. So I bought the books, looked at the websites, searched newspapers using a subscription service, and with all of those, I'll share information about the Moffat Expedition during this four-part video. And I've come to some different conclusions uh, than uh, some of the people that I'm going to talk about. In my opinion, there are two separate but intertwined questions about the Moffat tragedy. First, could the 14th September accident have been avoided? And second, Art originally planned to arrive at Baker Lake on 15th September. Why on the 14th were they at the inland of Marjorie Lake, 200 canoe miles from their destination? So what did Moffat do? Why was he there? Quote, the purpose of their venture was to make a documentary film of canoe travel through a portion of the North American boreal forest and tundra zone and to obtain a pict pictorial record of both the wildlife and any Aboriginal peoples that they might encounter. Also, they plan to collect archeological materials along their route. Now, people have analyzed uh, the Moffat expedition from a canoe point of view, but I'm an academic. And so my questions, which are not answerable right now, is if I were to have done this goal, um, I would have had, there are two people who did the photography, and that was Art and Skip. Uh, Art on the, on the video, ca on the camera, uh, film camera, and, and Skip on a 35 millimeter. I would have had a, um, an archaeologist trained in archaeology. I would have had a geologist. I would have had a botanist, and I would have a zoologist to make up the six. Uh, the only thing I know about uh, the group is, is from what they were published is uh, what schools they graduated from. That to me is less important than their uh, area of expertise. And in addition to that, um, I would have gone after a grant. Did he go after, let's say, a National Geographic grant? That would have been a feather in his cap. He wanted to become known uh, and appreciated uh, for this, this genre. And I don't know whether he did that or not. He was a pretty independent individual. So let me suggest some things you might want to uh, review. Uh, the Sports Illustrated articles in 1959. I bought these on uh, an online auction site. 
danger and sacrifice, man against the barren grounds. And it's mainly from journal, uh, Arts Journal. He is buried up at Baker. Um, and some people have suggested that Sports Illustrated biased things uh, by uh, uh, not including uh, uh, information from the journal to make uh, art look more like a caricature. Two of the survivors have written books. George Grinnell wrote a book called A Death on the Barrens, and then later uh, Skip uh, wrote a book, uh, took umbrage at George's uh, uh, characterization of conversations and people, and wrote his own book called Barren Grounds, which is based mainly on journal entries. Uh, and one can criticize George quite a bit we're going to look at the uh, George Grinnell book. Uh, criticism is he put words in people's mouths and he put thoughts in people's minds. And um, so you have to take that with a grain of salt. But both books basically have the same, um, the same tensions, the same uh, storyline. Uh, they're not that different in terms of describing the, uh, uh, the expedition. So there's the uh, George Grinnell book. Um, you can see what, mo most of what he wrote by Jennifer Kingsley's essays. Those are uh, online. You can always stop this at any time and uh, uh, write down these, uh, these addresses. George was probably the least prepared of anybody on this trip. And here is an article on, from October 31st, 1955. Uh, remember, the accident happened in September. So this is relatively recent to the accident. And they interviewed him. And 18-year-old uh, uh, George Grinnell of New York City. There's another New Yorker. Isn't that interesting? You don't trust New Yorkers. One of the Dubon canoeists said most of them lack proper equipment for northern travel. Their leather boots were continuously wet and their feet became cold, swollen, and numb. We seldom took our boots off to get our blood circulating, he said. Other mistakes. The youth wore the wrong type of glove. Grinnell himself made the trip wearing two left-handed gloves without liners. Head nets proved little protection against hordes of black flies. Should have been um, alerted to that. Food was a problem because their packs lacked variety, misspelled. If you, eat, if you eat the same food every day, it begins to build up to the insecurity of the situation, Grinnell said. Uh, Grinnell was always uh, psychoanalyzing uh, situations and people. Uh, that's another thing that people didn't like about his book. But I'm going to have fun with this statement. You can see what, that he, he has really hyper- hyperbole in terms of his statements and and on page 36 of the book he has this statement that the Dubon River is the last garden of Eden on earth it is the most beautiful river on earth uninhabited and very dangerous well I can run with those statements the Dubon River is very dangerous I agree with George this is an article on uh, from September 23rd um, on September 23rd, after uh, a week had passed that they were supposed to be at Baker, an air search was initiated to find the party. They showed up at Baker Lake on the 24th. This is in all the newspapers. And this one says, in retracing a route taken in 1893 by J.B. Uh, Terrell, um, a Canadian government surveyor and one of the great men of Arctic exploration, the canoeist headed into one of the most forbidding regions on the continent. And I would agree, the Dubon River area, as I've experienced firsthand, is unforgiving if one relaxes one's guard. So I'd agree, George, that's, that's, that's okay. That's a truthful statement. Uninhabited, I don't agree with that. It's sparsely inhabited. There are signs of human activity. 
uh, the survivors ran into uh, a group of Eskimos. Is it a Garden of Eden? No, I disagree with that. You know, the a Garden of Eden, you didn't have to wear clothes because the temperature was the same. You didn't have to worry about where your next meal was from. The Garden of Eden had high species diversity. It would be really a neat place to do biological work. Uh, that's not the barren grounds. And in addition to that, I'm no religious scholar, but the Garden of Eden didn't really encourage knowledge, the search for knowledge. And that's what our expedition wanted to do. So we would have been kicked out of the Garden of Eden. I don't, don't think it's a Garden of Eden. Is it the most beautiful river on earth? Well, I know something about rivers. You see, I was born on an island surrounded by rivers. So here's my family home. I, um, if you can see it, this is my home right there. And um, it's on the top of Manhattan Island. It has the, on the left side is the Hudson River. On the north is the Harlem River. So I, I know, I know rivers. Hey, look, I know rivers. And in fact, I can show you right there that I'm fishing here as a 14 year old. And that's one of the, um, uh, one of my skills that I brought to the expedition that uh, Don and I were the fishermen uh, in that. So that was one of my skills. In addition to that, I had done research on rivers. I, you know, I'm a bona fide scientist researching rivers like the Harlem River. So every day in 1954, I was 12 years old, I would go down, find these empty whiskey bottles, which was easy to find, and put notes in the bottle and throw them into the river. And so one of the one of the notes finally was returned to me. I was really excited. So here's the original note. This bo bottle was sent out on December 3rd, 1954, off Manhattan Island at 4:30. See how how detailed I was that I filled out everything except for the three and 4:30, and I got back a um, a message. I was really excited. So this was something like five or six months later. He says, hello, Joel, I'm afraid your little note didn't get very far. I found it July 10th in the Hudson River at 247th Street or Riverdale. Now, you have to understand, uh, I threw the note in the river at 200th Street and it went two miles upstream. Why not throw it off the Staten Island Ferry next time? Little New York humor there. Uh, well, you know, well, maybe, maybe on second thought. Maybe the Hudson River where I live wasn't a river, but a tidal estuary. But I have been, I have been on some really spectacular rivers, like the Amazon River in 2010. How does the Amazon um, compare to the Dubond River? August 15th. After checking the traps and getting no animals and looking at the Eskimo camp, or at least the ring, I went back to sleep. We eventually left about 1030 rather late for us. The day was all right, except for a very, very rough trip before Wharton Lake. We had to portage about 250 yards and avoid three chutes and then walk and thread our way through about two miles of boulders and shallows. The river did not even look like a river, just a rocky plain. We took some chances and ended up usually okay, but after, but often high on a shallow rock shelf. Took chances. I guess to be human is to take chances. And when we talk about Eskimo camps, we're talking about uh, these sorts of archeological uh, remains. Well, this one on August 22nd, when we left the Dubon River, passed through the Dubon Delta, mainly a gravel pit. Now we are on the Thelon system and there's abundant firewood around. So I don't think, I don't think, George, that this is the most beautiful river on earth. 
And, uh, you know, if you keep making statements like that, your credibility of the book uh, can't be believed. Let's look at, at Skip's book, Barren Grounds. And he published that in 2014. If you want a an overview, uh, he has a, a commentary article in uh, uh, in the second reference, and uh, there's more information on the third reference. You don't have to buy the book. And then Al- Alan Kesselheim uh, has a good article uh, in the Men's Journal. And uh, I thank Alan. We had a uh, brief correspondence. And this is Skip's uh, overview, and I think this is realistic. The tragedy of September 14th, when Art Moffat died, occurred, in my opinion, because Art and I tried to concurrently accomplish two mutually exclusive objectives. Canoe, canoe travel and documentary filming of that journey. The demands of, the, of these opposing goals delayed and distracted our commitment to River Miles. Art and I remain tragically stubborn in our commitment to filming the journey, even in the face of serious and obvious deterioration of the weather. We succumbed to the romantic notion that we could retrace Terrell's epic journey in his image with hunting supported food supply, with traditional minimalistic equipment, without local guides, and at the same time make a movie of it all. The Thumb Party preceded us. They were a group of students basically from Princeton. The only reason you'll see them mainly is that uh, there is a newspaper article on the Indianapolis News. And then um, a person by the name of Charlie Maller tracked them down in 2005. That was something like 40 years afterwards because he thought that they were the first ones to travel the Dubont River after Moffat. And he tried to get them, I would think, to make these kind of inflammatory statements. Even the name Down at Dead Men's River uh, gives you an indication, uh, you know, of of the of the of what you would expect. I found I found this uh, to be very sm- uh, smug um, and self-congratulatory, and I wouldn't have even included this. But they the uh, thumb party came before us, and there is some information about how, what how they saw the the uh, country and how we saw the country. Uh, cha- things changed dramatically very quickly. So, for instance, Charlie says, I tracked down the first men to travel the length of the Dubont after Moffat's group. Moffat's misspelled. You mean, Charlie, besides any indigenous people, trappers, prospectors, survey crews by plane? Or, and actually I found two groups, one in 1961 and one in 1965, that looks like they uh, completed a, uh, I'm assuming they completed uh, this this route. So they weren't the first. They weren't the second. They even weren't, uh, well, they might have been the third uh, organized canoe party that went uh, through, that, through that area. And then we have Alan Jacobs. I think he published this in about 2015. Published it after Skip's book. And he wanted to uh, defend Art Moffat at basically all course. Jake has put together much but not all of the published material and comments on the Moffat expedition and some unpublished material, including parts of journals of the survivors. He felt strongly that Moffat had been defamed and challenged the charges made against Art in the expedition. He, ch- he tried to challenge every charge made. You may have to go online to search where the appendices are for that essay I just showed you. And there certainly have been many gratuitous statements made about the Moffat expedition. But Jacob's narrative uh, is a different sort of narrative. 
Jacob says, what did Moffat do? It was to complete the central segment of the Tyrell trip of 1893. Filming the experience was a secondary goal. Does any rational person believe the party knowingly risked lives in order to film? In other words, it went, went slow. Yes, Alan. As a rational human being and one who felt he risked his life on the Dubont to increase our scientific knowledge, I believe Art and Skip knowingly risked their lives in pursuit of filming. The other four in the group, probably not. Jacob's accident opinion puts most of the blame for the mishap of 14th September 1955 on what Terrell wrote and mapped about the area where the fatal rapids occurred. The biggest mistake Art made that day, according to Jacobs, was to trust Terrell, who, well, I'll, I'll see, I'll show you in a second. His evidence is that Jacobs couldn't find any mention by Terrell of rapids between the portage and the entrance to Marjorie Lake. It's not on his map, it's not on his report. Jacobs wrote that the Moffat party, though, knew that there were rapids in that river stretch, but had no further information about them, and I'm underlining that. We're going to look at that in the third video. Jacobs was convinced that information came from a correspondence between then 95-year-old Terrell and Moffat in 1955. That's not where it came from. It did come from Terrell, though. And there's kind of an inconsistency. So here is uh, Peter Frank, uh, September 27, 1955. Um, you know, he got to Baker's Lake on September 24th. And he has his own byline here. And he said, it was about three in the afternoon, September 14th, when the accident happened. We had been following a Canadian government survey map, which I assume is the Terrell map, during the entire trip and knew we were coming on the rapids. So that's an inconsistency because the Terrell map itself does not show any rapids. And I'm going to try and explain that in uh, video four, in video three. But we had no idea what we really were in for. The map didn't show them as being very dangerous. But, but, Jacobs never saw Terrell's transcribed notebooks of his trip. Instead, he wrote that Moffat had obtained a copy of J.B.'s report, that's a published report, which I believe, which I believe to be identical to his journal. I have been unable to access it. It's not identical. Terrell's published report is based on his notebooks, but the notebooks contain much more information. Moffat had access to the notebooks. I will show later that Terrell's river information was not always accurate before the accident area and that Terrell's notebook had a caution, if not a warning about the rapids in the mishap area. The information on the rapids that the Moffat group had access to wasn't the only factor in the accident of 14 September. Consider Peter Frank's statement here. And here is a September 27th interview. And Frank said upon his arrival from Baker Lake, 420 miles northwest of Churchill, they believed the tragedy occurred because of, quote, our hurry to get out of the country before winter set in. In our haste, we failed to look over each rapid, he said. I don't know if Jacob saw that news article but his response based on the Terrell information he had probably would have been that just because they were hurrying didn't mean they were taking unnecessary chances. Although they didn't scout, they didn't scout the rapids in question. Based on Terrell's information and the view from their canoes looking down their rapid before entering it, they, they did not anticipate how dangerous it was going to be. The mishap turned into a fatal accident due to the air and water temperature conditions of the Dubon River that mid-September 1955. So in part three of this trip video, when we approached the inlet of Marjorie Lake, where the accident occurred, I'll go into detail about the area, the canoeing choices. We went up a channel that, uh, that Moffat didn't go up. 
and show you the information on this area in Terrell's notebook for August 23rd and 24th, 1893. So that is part one of a four-part autobiography, adventure, scientific expedition to the Northwest.